All right, well, our work here now in this Blister Summit panel session is to just get a bit of the State of the Union on technology in the backcountry. The snow sports industry cannot stop talking about the backcountry, um, and I'm kind of for that, but we are seeing a whole lot in terms of new technologies coming out. I think there's probably a decent amount of confusion uh, for regular skiers and snowboarders about should I be adopting this? Is this something I can ignore? So the hope tonight is just to get a little bit of clarity on where we are today and maybe we open up the conversation to where we think things might be headed. So to help us on this, Alex, mm -hmm. tell the folks a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Alex Cernicciari. Uh, no pop quizzes on how that's spelled at the end of the panel. Don't worry. Uh, I am the U.S. Marketing Manager for uh, Ordovox here in the United States. Um, yeah. And, you know, we as a brand, uh, have been in safety for 40 years. Uh, Ordovox was the first uh, company to, uh, produce a dual band beacon. Um, so you used to have to have the same exact beacon as your friend or your backcountry partner in order to rescue them or in order to be rescued. Um, and we thankfully were the company that pioneered, um, you know, again, a multi-band beacon. And yeah, uh, ever since that, I mean, that means, you know, we want to make uh, backcountry equipment as accessible, as user-friendly, uh, and as widespread as possible. Hmm. Paul Forward. Uh, Paul Forward, I am uh, from Alaska, and I know Jonathan because you didn't give the intro this year about how I almost killed you when we met, but I Jonathan... love that you, I was going to let you off the hook this year, I, so I, was gonna... I love that you are bringing this back. Well, in. it's probably because of lack of good communication technology that that happened. Oh. But yeah, so Jonathan and I go back about 12 years and I've been um, doing stuff with Blister since then. And when I'm not doing Blister reviews, I kind of split my time in the winter. I work as a heli ski guide up at uh, Chugach Powder Guides in Girdwood, Alaska. And, uh, and then the rest of the year, I kind of work part time as a rural family slash emergency room physician um, and do some other stuff in that world as well. And uh, I guess from the electronic standpoint, um, I guess I'll just start the conversation. Basically, I think that... Uh, you know, in my mind, just thinking about earlier today, I'd, I'd categorize backcountry, like, and especially if we're going to consider tech electronics, which I think is kind of where we're going with this, I would say there's um, communications, and we can dive into that a little bit, and then there's um, safety, rescue, that we can, uh, Alex has a lot to share on that, and then um, navigation would be the other big category, and I feel like in my recreational and kind of professional pursuits, I use all three pretty extensively, and then there's like the big black hole of what are our smartphones, which can be all of those things at times or, or, uh, or none of those things. So wait a second though, let's go back to how we met. Okay. Are you calling that a communications issue and are not, you blaming me? Not at all. Okay. No, I think it, it was, uh, I was kind of making a joke, but well, do you ever, I, do you ever get to tell this version of the story or is it only I who tell it, No one's ever heard my side of it. I want to hear. I, <laughs> all, right, all right. All right. Let's go. It's, it might be the same. Right, let's go. Las Lanius, 2012. Yep. I was down there with some friends. I'd been there quite a handful of times before and I was met up with some buddies. Long story short, I was skiing really fast, maybe a little out of control. And right as I got up to my buddies who had just randomly ran into you and your buddies, yep. uh, to not physically run into, but that, that was my part. Yeah. Um, I uh, came in pretty hot, uh, le big left footed turn, and my left foot ski just completely exploded off my foot at the belly of the turn. And I came careening in on my uphill edge, and Jonathan and I had a very close encounter. I, I thought I was dead for sure. <laughs> I had no idea who this was. I was just like, this idiot, out of control American, and, and now he's one of my favorite people in the world, but um, <laughs> that's how we started. But you were not my favorite person when I literally thought I was like, like, you know, seeing the end of my life. To my credit, I did not touch you. We no. made no contact. No. <laughs> um, so it's, it's really from the, literally the, the millisecond, you know, initial meeting of Paul Ford, it has all been uphill. Uh, or, is that the right? It's all been, that's not the right Yeah, expression. I struggle with that also. It's all been we much all better. Uh, from, nice. from there. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Um, okay. So what do you think of the category breakdown that Paul just proposed? Yeah, I think it's super appropriate uh, if we're going to be mostly in the realm of electronics tonight. Huh. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I mean, I mean, all the gear we talked about is all tech in some way or another. And we just, obviously we talked to a lot of ski and boot people about the technologies they're employing, but I think we stick to electronics for now if that's okay with everybody. So where are we? And, and Paul, let me come to you within the guiding community. How much agreement is there? How much are guides all over the world, you know, kind of practicing using very different instruments, right? How much uniformity versus hegemony? The, I mean, the honest answer is I don't know. I know Alaska heli skiing and I don't know, like, I don't know European mountain guiding. I don't really know, like, even lower 48 ski touring guiding that well. So I, um, I can speak only to Alaska heli guiding, but in Alaska heli ski guiding, you know, it's somewhat unique in that with the helicopter, we can go really far away from everything pretty quickly and in places where like no other type of aircraft or motorized vehicle can get, we can get there real fast. And so um, that is awesome for the adventure and the skiing, but it presents a lot of challenges from like a, a safety and a redundancy of communication standpoint. And so I guess I can just launch into like how, how we do it. I mean, so our, so we're tracked in lots of different ways. So one, the machine, the helicopter itself is, has real-time flight tracking that's available to anyone with the login to that helicopter's program. So that's the first layer. There's always somebody watching that, you know, pretty much every minute we're out there, somebody's paying attention to what's happening with the flight tracking. And the flight tracking isn't just where it is, but it's also, is it, is it actively flying? Is it shut down? Is it turned on, but not, but not actually flying? So they get a lot of information there. That's the first level. Second level is, um, uh, communications that are like basically uh, cell phone if we're in service, which we're usually not, or satellite phones. Um, some operations have been experimenting with um, the, and we can talk about this more later, like the the two-way satellite messaging, like um, the most popular one is the Garmin InReach, but there's a few other products in the market like that um, that use different, some of them use different satellite systems, but um, partic- for our operation, that's a satellite phone. I find that it's really helpful to hear somebody's voice. It's also, you know, they're getting it in real time. You get an f- instant communication loop closure from the person you're talking to. They say, I say, I'm on, you know, ecstasy wall. And they say, copy, Paul's on ecstasy wall. Phone call ends up. And, uh, and then everybody knows what's going on. And then, uh, and then uh, we have VHF radios, which are powerful radios that we use to communicate between guide staff and the helicopter. And also we have a radio repeater, so we can call, make far calls with that. And then we also have uh, family band uh, five watt radios, usually the BCA models. Um, we've also experimented with lots of other types of radios like that that we use to communicate within our group from that guide and his or her specific guests. So lots of layers of communication just there, and that's not including the rescue communication, rescue electronic equipment, which we're also carrying, and our personal cell phones, which we use for lots of different applications. Gotcha. Do you want to speak to the communications front or do you want to weigh in on this question of how much uniformity is there versus different guides, different backcountry communities around the world are all asking for or using different things? Yeah, I mean, I think that goes back to, you know, there are a lot of standards now in place. I mean, especially obviously with with Beacon Communications, you're Every beacon you can buy on the market now, if it is a three antenna digital beacon, it operates on very specific frequencies. There is that uniformity in place, again, to make all of us safer, and that's incredible. Um, You know, on the communication front, that is something that we are largely um, sort of have withheld um, ourselves from. Um, You know, I'm not exactly sure what is in the product development team's minds right now. So, um, yeah. I can't speak to that too, too much. Um, but you know, it's, again, I think as we progress forward, um, we are seeing fewer and fewer analog beacons, um, out there. Um, you know, I think there is this trend away. F- I mean, there's of course a trend away from them. They are just, a, you know, that much harder to understand. They're that much less user friendly out of the box. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, uniformity is something that's coming. Um, and yeah, hopefully, yeah, there are various organizations, uh, sort of supranational organizations that will, will continue that and make communications to customers, um, sorry, marketing communications, sales communications easier to customers so that you always know what you're getting when you go into any store, whether it's, you know, the Alpineer here, somewhere in Denver, somewhere in Europe for their field that, um, 
you just understand exactly what you're what you are getting when it comes out of the box. Let's open it up to questions. Airbags. Thoughts, questions, where are we right now in terms of the technology, say from a guide's point of view? Um, should everyone have one anytime we're stepping into the backcountry? Paul, what is your opinion on that? Well, there's a lot of different questions there. Um, so the first one is um, where are, where do, where's the industry sit right now? I'm, I don't work for any airbag companies, but I've used pretty much, I think I've used every airbag technology, every airbag system out there, at least like in practice. And I would say that we're kind of like where maybe where we are with electric cars right now, where like the if the internal combustion engine is the the canister pack or the the, the compressed air cartridge, and the fan bags or fan style bags or maybe the EVs, like we're seeing some pretty significant changes in the tech and it's getting a lot better. And I think probably just like with electric vehicles, we're all going to be using fan packs in a, in a number of years. Um, but they all work really well. And we, I think I'm guessing everyone in this room understands the basic principles behind how airbag packs work and why we carry them. Um, to answer an audience question, um, I, I believe we were the first operation, in, at least in Alaska, if not in North America, to require pack, airbag packs of all our guests, whether they use ours or bring their own, but we, were, we supply them for everybody. Um, I think that, again, Alaska is unique in that our terrain, I think, loans itself to more benefit from that type of technology than other places. You know, if you're, if it's a real rocky terrain or like heavily treed terrain, I think the benefits are smaller. Um, I've talked to a lot of experienced guides um, about like D Doug Krause, who's a Irwin guide. He might show up here tonight. Um, he, uh, he and I've talked about a lot. He's a very experienced avalanche forecaster, very experienced guide has, has done, been doing the in, that in the industry for a long time. And like, he doesn't typically ski with an airbag pack in Colorado. But when he guides in Alaska, he does. Um, so I think there's some nuance there, and that's probably a, a whole conversation in itself. Um, but uh, it's, can can you actually just say a little bit more, just to spell it out for people, yeah. why why he Doug might not? Well, the downside. I mean, so I think there's a couple downsides to airbag packs. The obvious one is the weight; it just weighs more. I mean, that's a, the the lightest packs in the market now are five pounds. The lightest ski touring pack is pound and a half, or not, maybe not even that. And that's significant. I mean, that's that's a big deal. That's like, that's torque on your knees. That's weight you're carrying uphill. That's it's not small, a small thing. And then there's the, you know, there's there's not that much like high statistically powered research on these types of things in snow sports. But the idea of risk homeostasis is real, right? Yeah. You know, you get a seatbelt in your car. The car has better um, crumple zones. People drive faster. Speed limits go up. Fatality rates may or may not significantly change. In some cases, they do. But you get the point. I think that especially early on in the airbag, kind of advent of airbags, and I was like an early adopter. I had an ABS pack in like maybe the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, but th they can change your perspective on things, and I, I think that's a real thing. So. We cannot reiterate that enough. An airbag does not make you safer mm -hmm. at all. The snow is still the snow on the ground. If it's if it's wind loaded, it might still slide on you. It might still slide on you for an you know an infinite number of reasons. Of course, um, you know it is one tool to help present prevent the worst case scenario. But it is just that it is just a tool. You need to know how to use it, and you need to know how to use all the other tools in your arsenal to make sure that you come home safe at the end of the day. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that uh, analogy to the internal combustion engine versus EVs. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, from a tech standpoint, that's, you know, again, that's where the industry is going. We want to make these things lighter. We fully understand that they are heavy, they are expensive, much like real electric cars. Um, so, you know, as brands, we are working as fast and as hard as we can to make these more available to more people. Um, you know, again, as long as they do not sort of fall into that logical fallacy of, you know, an airbag will always save you because that's very, very dangerous. You know, if that's, we don't want anybody to take an airbag out on a day where they wouldn't go skiing otherwise. So the question is interference with safety equipment. What is the current best practice for where someone should be holding their phone or holstering their phone versus their beacon, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, yes, any electronic device, uh, any electronic transmission 
uh, absolutely interferes with your beacon, um, especially as we are seeing beacons get more and more sensitive. Um, if you're standing under power lines in the backcountry, it's a rarity here in Colorado, but it is possible, um, that will interfere with your beacon. Um, that will interfere with the with the uh, with the search function. Um, the absolute best thing to do is keep it as far away from possible. Um, you know, if you wear uh, your beacon in the chest holster, um, do not keep your phone in the chest pocket. Wear it in your pants or vice versa. Um, the other thing, your airplane, or sorry, your phone should always be in airplane mode. Um, the second you start touring, um, it is kind of one of those, you know, on and off at the car. Same with airplane mode. Uh, that will that helps a significant amount. There's no transmission being emitted from your phone, um, including Wi-Fi, including your phone sort of reaching around looking for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Um, it can wait. If you're in the backcountry, it should be able to wait. Yeah, we got we got rid of chest mounted GoPros at our operation for that reason because our guests were mostly wearing our using our beacon harnesses, and so we just made that a policy that we didn't do that for that reason. I think about it every day because I'm covered in electronics when I'm out there. I've got, I've got a beacon. I've got two radios. I've got an iPhone. I've got um, potentially a two two way messaging device. Um, so I think about it a ton, and I try to be really strategic in where I put everything. But it, that's the real thing for sure. And uh, when we practice, which we do a lot, we practice just like we would be in a real world scenario with all the stuff beeping and buzzing, for sure. Now, the whole question of okay, so put a phone in airplane mode, great, got it, everyone do that. At that point, does it become irrelevant where that phone is on you with respect to a beacon? No, because again, it goes back to it, like it's in the electromagnetic signal, so just your phone's battery, the app's running, you know. Um, yeah, you should absolutely have uh, a mapping function on your phone. Of course, you should have paper maps. Um, phones are a lot easier to use and somewhat more intuitive sometimes than a paper map and a compass. Um, you should. We advise minimum thirty centimeters, uh, about a foot. Um, so again, that's why we generally say like keep your phone in your leg pocket if you are wearing the chest harness or vice versa. Um, you know, deep inside your backpack is also an acceptable option. Um, yeah, there. If you are buried, there's no real depending on how you end up sort of under the snow, there is no absolute best because if your phone is on top of your beacon, when you're buried, there can be some interference. Or if you end up, you know, sort of in the fetal position and all of a sudden your phone's right next to your beacon, that's also interference. So try to keep them as far apart as you reasonably can. What, what do you think of the Faraday case idea that you mentioned? That, that was mentioned by the question. Yeah. Um, Certainly interesting, but that also goes back to, I mean, are you going to buy a Faraday case for every electronic device? And Say what that is. Yeah. It's basically a, um, a case that blocks the signals, that blocks yeah. electromagnetic signals. Mm -hmm. That Yeah, that would obviously be the ideal scenario, but depending on the equipment that you're using, it might not be entirely practical, especially if you are, I guess, in the instance of a backcountry injury where then, you know, if you can't reach your phone and it isn't, you know, in a Faraday case, you know, there's no way for you to let anybody else know that you might have a broken leg or, you know, something else that's not inherently life threatening, but they certainly need to, you know, evacuate or self evacuate for. Not to give a product plug for order box, which I actually haven't owned one since my F1 in like 30 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that technology you were talking about today was really cool where your beacon will sense electronic interference mm -hmm. and narrow and, and recommend a narrowed search grid, yes. right? Huh. Yes. Um, at least through the three plus and the three plus is 10, 11 years old now. Um, the three plus would indicate if you had a significant amount of electronic interference that would interfere with your beacons functionality, um, with the new direct voice, um, it will narrow the search strip width if it senses a significant amount of electronic interference. So our max search strip width is 50 meters, um, in the parking lot today with cars, cell phones. Um, I mean, you know, even patrols, radios, there's the hospital next door, their radio, um, signals, uh, we were seeing it go down to about a 30 meter search strip width. So that's just right. automatically right. happening as yes. opposed to sending an alert. Yes. Okay. It's pretty cool. Hmm. So the question is, can you all just talk a bit more about interference, what that actually looks like? or what a person in the backcountry's experience of interference would look like? 
I can only speak anecdotally. <laughs> I'm the marketing guy. So, um, I mean, if you've ever held a, uh, an active phone, especially while it's on a call, um, it is kind of fun. You can call your buddy, hold the phone right next to your beacon. I mean, you will see your beacon do crazy things. It will, like the range will fluctuate, you know, at, from the max to, oh my God, you're, you know, a half a meter above your buried victim to, and we have an arrow that will do a 360. Basically, we can make the arrow do 360s. Um, yeah, it's just, it throws your beacon for a loop. <laughs> yeah, we, you know, we when we practice, we practice our beacons a ton. And uh, like, you'll see phantom signals on certain models there. You'll, you'll, you know, you're doing a search because someone told you there's in the scenario, there's two, bur two burials and all of a sudden you've got a phantom signal. There's a third one or something. Um, I've seen every permutation of that over the t over years, especially when I'm standing around a bunch of other guides and everybody's got two radios on and a beacon and an iPhone and whatever else. Uh, um, it's a real thing for sure. And the more you play with your whatever beacon you choose, the more you'll notice that stuff for sure. And mm -hmm. even like like you said, like buried electrical lines or like big pieces of metal nearby, <laughs> helicopters. <laughs> and I mean, depending on how far you want to go down the rabbit hole, test that. Test that stuff. I mean, it's a great thing to know, to have in your back pocket if you are in a more densely populated or sort of more of a dense backcountry zone or, you know, one that's closer to civilization. Um, you know, yeah, call your phone, text your buddies with your beacon, you know, within a meter of the phone and see what your beacon does. So that way you know how to respond to it. You might be able to better understand, um, yeah, when your beacon is is uh, experiencing, you know, electronic interference. And then figure out solutions. So, like, is it turning your stuff off? Is it rebooting the beacon, turning it on, turning it off again, rest like re physically restarting the search function? Like, different things. Figure out what seems best with your device and play with it. So the question is, all right, given all that, is there technology being developed? Are there solutions being developed right now to address these issues of interference? I would say yes. Um, so with uh, with this new wave of you know electronic fan packs being developed and implemented, um, it's another piece of electronic equipment on your body. And it is interesting how sometimes a solution can be a problem. Um, there are instances. Um, there is a Canadian study. I cannot remember the authors of it, sadly, um, that shows that there is electronic interference on beacons from fan packs when they are on. Um, and I know recently, I believe it was sometime this past fall, October or November, uh, most beacon and airbag pack manufacturers actually met in Salt Lake City to discuss how to mitigate the issues. So it is absolutely front of mind, um, at least for us. Um, I mean, I mean, you know, we flew over our um, our head of beacon development from Munich, Germany, specifically just to attend this uh, you know two day conference on this one specific issue of electronic interference. How much? attention are you to paying or how much are you seeing in terms of apps uh, that are supposed to keep people out of particularly, you know, avi prone terrain? There seems to be a lot happening on this front, right? And um, thoughts on this, kind of the general movement? I, um, I know those things are out there. And um, we've talked about it a lot in various kind of like avalanche circles and guide circles, whether there's like, uh, whether that's coming someday where we actually will have that good a resolution on terrain. Uh, and then maybe, you know, who knows, AI or machine learning that will help us figure that, you know, connect that to the, what the weather's doing or historical snowpack data. Um, I don't think as it stands right now, the resolution is nearly good enough um, to, to make like meaningful decisions based on that. I think that, you know, you only need a 50 foot vertical foot slope to, to kill you. <laughs> and if that slope is, if the average of that slope that the contour lines show is, is 32 degrees, but there's a roll in there that's 35, like that doesn't, like, I don't think that's a particularly useful tool right now. Maybe to give you some general ideas on where to go, but I, I struggle with that a little bit. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, the broad strokes, like you mentioned, I mean, if it means keeping out of a terrain trap because you can see, you know, have a general idea, you know, they might help with tour planning better as a result. Sure. Uh, assuming very proper education, go get your Airy One. This is the Airy One plug. If you don't have it and you are traveling in the backcountry, please at least get your Airy One. Um, it is incredibly important. 
Um, it's a start. It's a start of a, an endless education in snow safety. Um, yeah, but it's, you know, it's not going to solve every problem because, I mean, even with AI and historical data, I mean, weather weather is an endless anomaly, right? I mean, it's there's enough, there's no two days are ever the same. Are you all familiar with some of this, um, these developments, these apps that are allegedly, if you're going out into the backcountry, there are you're getting signals and indicators of like, stay away from that slope or stay away from here. This looks good. Some folks is pretty new. Okay. Um, okay. Small sample size, but it's helpful to note. And the answer is not that many people are up on this yet. And maybe that's a good thing. Yeah. And I think like the gist of it is for those not familiar, the gist of it is you, you know, like if you've spent much time with a topo map or paper one, you get pretty good at looking at the lines and figuring out how steep a slope is. Um, and there's tools, there's you know, little ways to calibrate and figure out exactly how steep it is. Um, and some of those tools are basically doing that calculation for you and telling you what the slope angle is, what, you know, color coded or otherwise. And they're, they're telling you what the elevation is and what the aspect is in a way that's instead of having to like look and say, oh, that's northeast and this is 7,000 feet on the topo map, it might just give you that information in a text form or otherwise. Um, I think it's it's fine if it simplifies it. I, again, I don't. My limited experience with those is that um, I, I think about the word resolution a lot. I think about that word a lot when I think about avalanche problems. Like I know the general avalanche problem. What's my resolution? And is it down to a super fine scale, and I really, really am, am, know exactly what's going on, or is it big, broad picture, um, low resolution? And I think that those at, those aren't particularly high resolution tools right now, in my opinion. So the question was, these apps that we're talking about, could they in fact create new forms of risk if they're giving a false sense of security? Um, I think I know the answer to this one. It would be yes, but you all have also said, I mean, this is going to progress. I don't think these are going away. In fact, they're so new, I think we will be seeing more resolution there. But um, yeah, if they were all released right now, um, I think the answer is, yeah, it, it could pose risks if you're just saying, I don't need to pay attention. I don't really need to know anything. Um, you know, so I, I, something that you do about that? <laughs> so, so a follow-up question is, is there, what do you recommend we do about that? Um, I would even take it one step further and say many of these apps are arguably social, at least somewhat in nature where, you're recording a track, you're posting a track. And I mean, you can be the seventh person, you can be the first person, you can be the 50th person that day and you can still trigger a slide. So just because, and if you see that social aspect and that somebody skied it that day, that doesn't still, that does not mean that there is still not an avalanche problem by any means. And so that is also another sort of really scary aspect of these apps, at least, at least for me, um, especially in, again, very sort of high density backcountry places like Colorado. Yeah, and I think it's like every, to, to, to kind of like dovetail with that, it's like every piece of equipment we've talked about, you know, they all require whether it's an airbag pack or an avalanche beacon, if that technology does get refined and it does really become super meaningful, it's still gonna require a lot of education and practice, I would think, to, to use it appropriately. And hopefully that's where, you know, avalanche courses and the, you know, good community, like a culture of safety, would uh, maybe allow those things to become useful tools at some point. And, and, and you know, we haven't really touched on the navigation component that much, but that's a, to, to kind of segue into that, that's a huge thing right now. I mean, navigation in the backcountry, whether it's skiing or any other activity, has never been easier. It's also never been easier to be completely pickled by your <laughs> failed technology <laughs> when you get out there and all of a sudden you're, you're phone needs to refresh its iOS or the battery dies or who knows. Um, and if you don't have those other basic navigation skills or paper map and compass back up, um, yeah, it could, there's a lot of potential for problem there for sure. So the question is, um, you know, with all of our modern phones, we're pretty used to getting pretty, pretty pinpoint accuracy in terms of locating another phone or the AirPods that I left somewhere down on Elk Avenue that are still there, but I had a summit to run. So, um, so if you find one AirPod, pick that up for me. Um, but 
what about eventually, you know, we, um, we sort of evolve past the beacon and these are things that there's a slide, you know, we have a sort of an air tag esque type of technology. We grab our phones and we go find our touring partners. Yep. The tech is just not there right now. Um, this might be a little bit of a chain of an answer. So most commercial GPSs that you can buy, uh, you know, buy at REI, whether it's Garmin InReach, any one of their competitor brands, um, is accurate down to about two meters. Um, and if you are shoveling two meters, I mean, even two cubic meters of snow, that is extra up to a ton, an, an actual ton, not just, you know, uh, the, the, the phrase. Literal, literal yeah, ton. Yeah, a literal yeah. ton of snow. Um, that takes time. That takes a significant amount of time, especially if you are the only rescuer involved. Um, and the really scary statistic is, is that um, if you are excavated and rescued within the first 15 minutes of burial, we found that you have a 90% survival rate. If you are excavated after a half an hour, you have a 40% survival rate. Um, and then it's, you know, 45 minutes to an hour is 30%. So that first 15 minutes is fundamentally critical. Um, and that is why we at Ordovox do everything we can do to ensure that, uh, you know, the, the buried victim is excavated within 15 minutes. And GPS at this time um, is just not there. And then, yes, there is, you know, sort of that air tag technology, uh, shortwave communication, I think it is, um, is bandied about. Um, it doesn't have the proven reliability yet in our eyes to be um, something that we are comfortable putting on the market for a consumer to buy um, when when a life is on the line. I've played with it before. I've only played with putting a phone in a backpack and burying it and trying to find my phone. It's, like, it's not that great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the question is, what do you all consider to be the most important piece of gear you carry into the backcountry? Hmm. I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it can't be a singular piece. I would say it's a set, a kit. This is not a product plug. It is your Beacon Shovel Probe. Um, hopefully you've tour planned in advance. Um, you know, maps and navigation are incredibly important, but um, the only life-saving equipment is arguably Beacon Shovel Probe. And even if you remove any one of those pieces, you're looking at just blowing that 15 minute figure, that half hour figure even out of the water. Um, probe lines are scary if you've ever seen them. Um, they take a long time, especially in a larger avalanche. Um, as I mentioned, you're trying to move literal tons of snow without a shovel. Um, yeah, I mean, if you had to leave one at home, I guess the probe, because you at least know what the smallest number is and maybe you can put something else. But even then, if you don't know what you're shoveling towards, it's not a really strong situation to be in. I mean, the cliche like, avalanche course answer is like your skill set, your brain, your knowledge, your experience. I mean, that's by far the most important thing. As far as the individual piece of gear, I mean, we're, we've really focused on avalanches in our discussion. And so I would agree, like for avalanches, obviously the beacon probe shovel like overall in general, like wilderness backcountry travel, if we're talking just about safety, bad things happen, you could argue that um, the like satellite communication device is pretty, pretty pr probably saves a lot of lives or probably creates a lot of unnecessary rescues too. But, <laughs> and, but. So the question is, some of our phones now have satellite communications. What are your thoughts on that? So. So I have really mixed feelings on it. Um, so in addition to the stuff we talked about, the other thing I spent a lot of my time doing is just like uh, other types of extended wilderness travel, whether that's like, you know, multi week or multi-week, like river trips, kayaking or pack rafting, or uh, I do a lot of long, like long solo hunting trips where I'm out by myself in very remote places for three plus weeks at a time. And uh, I've, I have a family, I've got a wife and a kid at home, and uh, I carry... These days, since I've had a since we had a baby, I carry a satellite phone and an inReach. I almost never use a satellite phone, um, but I like having that. My wife really likes that I have that, and it, you know, I keep the the inReach device 
on a tied tether in my pocket and I keep it there all the time. It's stuck to my pants all the time. On one hand, it's cool. It's like great. And that's where these iPhones are going to go, right? Eventually, like we see in the iPhone 14 with the re emergency rescue function. Um, and I, I guess I wouldn't be shocked if, you know, our iPhones or whatever type of phone it is become two effective two-way satellite communication devices. Part of that's great. You know, I can carry less stuff. I should probably save 16 ounces out of my kit. Um, that said, like the, the correlator, all the stuff about tech is like it, it takes something away, right? Like most of us are probably are, uh, are old enough that we've experienced like a lot of backcountry adventures pre cell phones, pre, you know, pre having sat phones or messaging devices. And there's, there's something weird about it. If everybody's going to have communication, two way communication in the backcountry that sits a little uneasy with me, takes away from the experience a little bit. But I think from a safety standpoint, it's probably a good thing. Yeah, I don't think I have much to follow up on that. I mean, it's it is probably a good thing, but it also doesn't ever replace the sure. skill set sure. of you know. I mean, even in the summer, knowing how to self evacuate, um, or you know, knowing how to at least set a a signal. Really hope it's not a fire anymore. You know, a mirror would be ideal, obviously, to to signal other people. You know, in in the terrain that you're in, if there are any. The the other just one more thing I'd add. The thing I really worry about with that technology becoming common is we already, and I mentioned earlier the unnecessary rescues, but on one hand, unnecessary rescue, it's like expensive, but on the other hand, you're, it could become, it could become a real issue. You know, like there was a while there with, um, with a couple of devices that were on the market with, um, there was one particular that had a defective SOS button and that's bad, right? It's expensive. It's embarrassing for the person who's out there when the helicopter shows up and they're just having a great time on their canoe trip. Um, but it also, it, it really takes a lot of resources at risk people's lives that are flying into areas where the weather might be adverse. And so I think that that needs to tread very cautiously toward putting a two-way satellite communication device in every person's pocket who's off the grid. Um, I think there could be a lot of downside to it. <laughs> so the question is, Paul, you talked about you carry a lot of tech on you when you're in the backcountry or you're guiding. How do you think about that in terms of like absolutely critical tech or gear to have versus maybe nice to have, maybe sort of fully optional? Um, so I would say, you know, we're talking about snow stuff here. We're talking about avalanches, so I'll stick to that. So I would, I would agree with Alex, you know, the beacon, as far as our electronics that are out there, if you're going to leave every electronic home but one, <laughs> bring your beacon, obviously. Um, and, you know, I, I'm speaking when I'm talking about carrying all this stuff. That's in a professional setting where, like, I am responsible for the lives of a lot of people, including other guides and pilots. And a lot of times I'm making those decisions, and I want to have every resource possible to both make right decisions, have all the information, and then also to, if something d d bad does happen, to, like, be able to very expediently get all the resources I need there. And so it's overkill, you know, to have a satellite phone in my pocket um, at all times turned on that I can receive calls from. It's, it's overkill for recreational use, and I would not be doing that. So I think Beacon is probably the one thing, and I've spent I've gone on a lot of ski tours in my life when that was the only electronic on my body. <laughs> yeah, I'd reiterate that. Um, maybe navigation, um, if for whatever reason you refuse to carry a paper map. I mean, maybe make sure that there is some device, whether it is, you know, a larger Garmin device um, that has a has a screen with a map on it. Um, yeah, I mean, I've gone on tours in what I would consider my backyard practically where I don't even bother pulling my phone out. I know the terrain so well. I know exactly where the skin track goes. I know the major terrain traps and I'm going to stay away from them. Um, but, you know, if you're in an area where you're not as familiar, make sure you have at least some device, if it's not a map, that can show you where you are on a map. I think we're going to leave it at that. Um, I want to say thanks to both of you for some of the reminders, which are so critical. It's like, right, I knew that I maybe didn't have it front to mind. So we appreciate the reminders. And I also really appreciate getting your perspective. You've both said a lot tonight, like it's not there yet which is, I think, to say we're going to be seeing a lot of developments in this world. So I appreciate you kind of filling all of us in in terms of like where we might be headed 
and we'll see what technology kind of gets there. So thanks to both of you and thank you for the very good questions. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you.